Hey there, just quickly, this video is actually part of a much larger video that I uploaded on the 11th of May. Be sure to check it out if you want to watch all of it at once, but I thought I'd make little versions because I know four hours can be quite daunting for some people. So here is the sixth Doctor's era, and let's get straight into it. And yeah, now is the twin dilemma. Now with Peter Davidson gone at the end of the previous story, we now have Colin Baker, who is unfairly, in my opinion, maligned as the Doctor. But this story does not help his case. This story has cheap wobbly sets again, something that we've not had for quite a while, in my opinion. Basically, all the way back at the start of this season, really dodgy costume design, really bad acting from a lot of the supporting cast. Not all of them, but definitely a lot of them. The Doctor strangling Perry, which has always been an interesting choice. And despite the fact that Colin Baker is acting his absolute heart out and you can see how good he can be, this story is so bad for him. Honestly, the only reason why I'm not giving this any lower than a 3 out of 10 is because sometimes it is so bad it's good. But still, yeah, this story is bad. There's a reason it has the reputation it does. 3 out of 10. And that was season 21. Yeah, just one story for the sixth Doctor. Honestly, I've always found this a very weird decision as, as you can see from my ratings, it's one story. And as you can see from my rankings, it's one story. And it's not good. It is bad. It's a three out of 10. No good. It ruins season 21 massively and really dampens the start of Colin's era, which yeah, let's, let's move on to the rest of his era because it's much better. Season 22 is a very experimental season for Doctor Who. After Resurrection of the Daleks did a 45 minute time slot instead of 25 minutes, the rest of season 22 follows suit. Now, despite rumours, apparently this was always planned for season 22 and Resurrection of the Daleks kind of turned into the pilot idea for it. But either way, I quite like the change in format. I'd also state that a lot of the issues with Colin's Doctor in the previous story have mostly emphasis on the mostly been fixed, but this is still a very different Doctor to what we used to. Perry is also mostly emphasis again on the mostly been fixed from the previous season as well, but season 22 is not very well liked by a lot of fans. I don't mind it as you'll see as we go along. There's definitely some issues, but as per a lot of stuff when it comes to Doctor Who, I think a lot of people say it's worse than it actually is. Let's get into it. Attack of the Cybermen is a brutal story. It's a direct sequel, strangely enough, to Tomb of the Cybermen all the way back in season 5, 17 seasons prior, which is strange enough as it is. On top of that, this is probably the most violence Doctor Who's ever done, with a lot of blood and a lot of action and a lot of violence, just very strangely in this. It honestly felt like watching an R-rated or 15-rated movie, and I kind of liked it, but also didn't. I'm quite a horror fan, but Doctor Who's never felt like it should get to this level of violence, and even though it does, I think it kind of works for the story they're trying to tell. Six and Perry are quite good in this one, even if they do still feel a bit odd, and all the stuff with the Cybermen is really cool. I don't like the little crystal people who I've forgotten the name of. Uh, they're very strange and feel like a last minute addition for no real reason. Even so, I'd say this is honestly a great proper start to Six, and a solid 8 out of 10. Vengeance and Varos is what most people cite as their favourite Sixth Doctor story, and I think there's definitely a reason for that. A lot of stuff to do with the Sixth Doctor was weird and controversial, and Vengeance and Varos was no exception. It takes direct aim at stuff like reality television, the way that we consume violent media, the way that stuff is overemphasized in the media, a lot of stuff to do with politics, the way that we as a society, even nowadays with stuff such as the so-called cancel culture, will victify and essentially try and destroy people through the power 
of the online and television. And Vengeance and Varus's commentary is so good and near perfect, and sometimes is perfect. I'd honestly say that there's a lot more to talk about when it comes to Vengeance and Varus, but it can all be summed up by just watching it yourself. And Six and Parry, really starting to grow on me, I'm not gonna lie. It's another 8 out of 10. Maka Tharani is honestly a strange story. This is another one of those Marmite stories where some fans love it, some fans hate it, whilst once again, I just think it's good. I really, really love Farani. I think she's such a good counterpoint to both the Master and the Doctor. And I think putting the Master in this story really does help this. It makes her seem so different from the Master than just being the Master with boobs, which is what a lot of people do put the Rani down as, and wrongly so in my opinion. A lot of this story though does feel very dragged out, especially part two which is a very slow episode in my opinion until the final 10 minutes. It's kind of a problem with the story overall where moments will drag on, but I'd honestly say this is where Colin Baker fully starts to click into his role of the Doctor, even if Nicola Bryant's Perry falls behind. Even so, a solid 7 out of 10. It's good. As I've mentioned time and time again, Robert Holmes is one of my favourite writers when it comes to Doctor Who. And not only did he write a multi-Doctor story in this season, but it was also with Patrick Trout and the second Doctor, one of my definite favourites. And bringing back Jamie, one of the most beloved companions in Doctor Who history. And it's a three-parter, aka the equivalent of a six-parter, which is not very good. Even though this story has some Tarans in it, but some Tarans are literally just absolutely worthless and shouldn't be there. Two has nothing to do in this story. It honestly feels more like they just wanted to put Jamie and Sixth Doctor together, and they do work really well. The main issue I have with the two Doctors, though, is how slow and boring this story is. The entirety of episode two is complete filler. And honestly, you've cut out a couple of moments from episode one, cut out the majority of episode two, and you could easily have one very solid episode. But overall, it's really boring at times. I can't give it any higher than a five out of 10. Speaking of relatively boring stories, Time Lash is probably one of the most hated Sixth Doctor stories after the twin dilemma. And I sort of get why. I think there's definitely some positives that people like to ignore. I think the overall makeup design for the villain is really damn good. I think it is one of the most impressive monsters of the 80s. And as a really big fan of War of the Worlds, seeing HP Wells in this is one of the coolest things I've ever ever seen in Doctor Who. I wish that H.G. Wells was in more Doctor Who stuff as he is such an icon, but I guess I have to listen to A.S. audio dramas for that. Even so, um, as you probably noticed as I'm rambling throughout this, I'm not mentioning the plot because it's not very good. It's very generic. A lot of the sets look horrifically cheap or bland. There's a random connection to the third Doctor which literally goes nowhere. Yet, Time Lash is fine. It's one of those stories. I'd give it a 5 out of 10, mostly because H.G. Wells is in it, I'm not gonna lie. Revelation of the Daleks is the best Sixth Doctor story. I'm not even gonna beat around the bush because his ear is sadly relatively short. This story is great, near amazing, but slightly missing out, partly because of the first part. So this story is all about double acts. Every single character will have a contrasting character or a companion character, and it works so perfectly. And yeah, it's really entertaining. The colours in this story are so vibrant. It feels so 80s so beautiful, so colourful. The Daleks in it are basically non-existent because this is actually a Davros story. And this is the most amount of character we get out of Davros in any era, modern or classic. And he is perfectly played by Terry Malloy. There is no fault as to why Terry Malloy is seen as the classic Davros, 
This story is great. I just wish the first part was a little bit faster paced, but still, 8 out of 10. And that's season 22. Kind of a mixed bag at certain points, especially during the middle section where it starts to fall apart before picking it up at the end. But I think this season is unfairly hated. There's a lot to love here. I mean, as you can see from my ratings, three of the stories are an 8 out of 10. That's some of that a lot of seasons definitely can't say, looking at you, middle part of the Tom Baker era. And yeah, even though there's a couple that are more forgettable and bland, such as the two Doctors and Time Lash, even when we change them over to the rankings themselves, they're not the worst. Like, I've seen much worse. I don't see why Time Lash is as hated as it is. It's just a bit generic with a couple of dodgy sets. Something which by this point we should be very used to as Doctor Who fans. I honestly don't mind season 22. I grew to quite like Tom Baker partway through this season. And I think he gets even better with his second and sadly final season. But yeah, season 22, the 45 minutes just works for me. I wish they continued it, but this season sadly kind of got the show semi-cancelled. But more on that in just a minute. Season 23 of Doctor Who came at a very difficult time. The show was technically cancelled slash put on hiatus slash not renewed, and it took 18 months for this season to come out. Now, the previous season only had 13 episodes, but they were equivalent to 26 episodes if in a 25 minute format. With this season going back to the 25 minute format, it only had 14 episodes, almost half of the runtime of the previous season. The budget was also cut in certain aspects, but increased in others, strangely enough. And honestly, this season is very transitional between the mid 80s to the end of the 80s. And not everything works in this season, even if some of it is definitely much better. One of the biggest things that a lot of people cite this season for is how it's nicknamed the Trial of a Time Lord. Continuing on from season 16, Sakita Time, all these stories are interconnected. However, I know some people count them as Trial of a Time Lords part 1 to 14, but for me, there's a distinct start and ending to four individual serials, which are just highly connected like the key to time. So I'll not be counting this as one long story. I will be counting them into four parts, like they are counted on on the DVDs and Blu-rays, for instance, because even though they're massively connected, I wouldn't say they're that much more connected than all the stuff with the key to time. Honestly, I, I think some people are a bit too obsessed with calling this a 14 parter. Either way, let's get into it. The Mysterious Planet is once again written by our old friend Robert Holmes and is quite interesting and intriguing for the first three parts. It all focuses on a weird planet, thus the term the Mysterious Planet, and is also the introduction to the Trial of a Time Lord storyline, which will occasionally, at the start and end of the episodes, just kind of cut in and just acknowledge they are on trial and all the characters are watching these events just like us as the audience. Now, a lot of the plot of this one is fine, it's relatively genetic. Savlon Glitz is an amazing introduction as a not companion recurring character in the classic era, and honestly, Six and Perry are really damn good in this episode. But there's one important part where, whilst watching the episode, some parts of what Savlon Glitz says is admitted from the courtroom, something which will come into play later on in the season. And I think it's a good little way to connect it without making it so the story is necessary viewing for the finale. Overall, I'd give the story a 7 out of 10. It's a good start. Mind Warp is one of the darker stories of season 23. After the controversy of season 22's very dark turn, season 23 was mostly lightened up, apart from this story. And I think it works really well in the story's favour. A lot of this story focuses on Perry and Six's relationship and the connection between this and Vengeance and Varos from the previous season with the villain Syl. It helps a lot, and Brian Blessed is in this goddamn story. That automatically makes it at least a 5 out of 10 at the very minimum. If everything else was shit, 
it'd still be a five because you've put Brian bloody blessed in it. Everyone loves Brian Blessed. And the connection to the courtroom this time feels a lot more intertwined. And the ending for Perry really does break my heart. But there is a certain thing revealed later on, which does cause this story to be a 7 out of 10 instead of an 8. But I'll explain that when we get to it. Terror of the Vervoids is one of the most generic Doctor Who stories of season 23. This time we're flashing forward in time to show the Doctor and new companion Mel after about a year of her being a companion according to additional resources and it is honestly a bit confusing at times. I like the concept of us seeing the Doctor's future but that also makes the trial stuff kind of obsolete because we know now they're definitely not going to kill the Doctor because he has to meet Mel. I know there's time and stuff they can do to remove it, but even so, it does take away some of the pressure from the overarching plot. Even so, I'd say Terror of the Vervoids is honestly really fun. It's dumb, it's stupid at times, and Mel's scream does make you want to shoot Bonnie Langford in the face. No offense, Bonnie. Loving you in the modern era. But yeah, this isn't the best introduction to Mel. Even so, I'd say Terror of the Vervoids is written really well. It's got a solid plot. Colin Baker is acting his absolute ass off in this story and honestly the makeup and costumes and stuff in this story are really good. It's a 7 out of 10. The Ultimate Fur is one of those stories that people mostly talk about for the behind the scenes issues compared to the in front of camera stuff. So I'll just quickly mention, yes, it was originally written by Robert Holmes. He passed away partway through. Eric Sayward, the script editor, wanted to continue Robert Holmes's finale, but was told he couldn't because it might cancel the show. So he left as well, and GMT took over as script editor for this story. But as a story itself, as a two-part finale to all the courtroom stuff that's been going on, I don't think it's as bad as people say. Yes, the first part is definitely much better than the second one because it's written by Robert Holmes. And a lot of elements of the first part aren't really explored in the second part due to copyright issues. But I'd say it's a good finale. It ties up a lot of the events and all of the issues, but it does undo Perry's death, which pisses me off, which is the reason why the previous story was given as a seven instead of an eight. Even so, I'd say it's still good. This season's very solid. 7 out of 10. And that's season 23. As you can see from my ratings, very ridiculously consistent. All the stories are a 7 out of 10. Some I'd say are definitely better than others, but only marginally, and they still deserve the same point. The best example of that is Mind Warp, which I would give an 8 out of 10, but I really dislike how the finale undoes Perry's death. I felt like it was a poetic way for her to end as a companion. Six's irritating arrogance to her, finally causing her to die, and the trial literally taking one of the Doctor's closest friends from him out of something he couldn't control. I think it was a much better end for Perry than what was given. And yeah, I'd say this season's pretty good. It's a shame this is Colin's final season. I would have liked to have seen him do one more. But due to a lot of behind the scenes stuff, he was fired after the end of this season and a new actor with Sylvester McCoy was put on to take his place. And well, quickly change him over to rankings, but they're honestly, once again, they're still all sevens out of 10. And with the Sixth Doctor not coming back for the next season, that kind of sums up season 23 in a way. A dramatic end, which kind of goes out with both a bang and a whimper at once. But even so, as I said, that's the end of the Sixth Doctor. So next week, we'll look at the Seventh Doctor. If you want to, you can check out the massive, massive far along video that I did ages ago by this point. And until next week, toodles.